What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats Podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We've got a fantastic episode lined up for you today because we are talking to the one and only Patriots defensive coordinator, Demarcus Covington. In my opinion, someone we haven't spoken enough about to this point in the lead up to the 2024 NFL season, obviously. Change at head coach. There's been a lot of conversation about Gerard Mayo. Obviously, a new draft pick at quarterback. A lot of conversation about the quarterback competition. Who should start? When should Drake May actually get in there and be able to play? Let's talk a little bit about the Patriots' defense today. Because in 2024, if you're listening to this podcast, you are a Patriots fan who is hoping to find something to sink your teeth into in order to keep you invested, in order to give you hope for... Maybe not so much the here and now, but the future of this organization. Drake May's one thing, it might be a little while before you actually get to see him. What you will get to see on Sunday, we know for a fact, is a defense that should still be, in my opinion, pretty damn good. And Demarcus Covington is going to be the one who's at the controls for that defense, calling the plays for the first time. So let's use this opportunity. I had the chance to speak with him one-on-one at the Patriots facility earlier in the day on Thursday, recording this on Thursday afternoon. Had a great conversation, but let's use this opportunity as a little bit of an introduction to the new Patriots DC. What is he all about? What makes him tick? What does he want this defense to be? How does he envision this defense being able to put its best foot forward on the field in order to allow this Patriots team to compete If that's all you're looking for, if you understand, if you are realistic as a Patriots fan and you're just hoping that they can put a competitive product on the field, you know that it's going to have to be because their defense is successful. And whether or not they're successful is going to hinge largely on the decisions made and the preparation provided to the players by DeMarcus Covington, 35 years old, born in Birmingham, Alabama, went to Samford as a receiver, but obviously worked his way over to the defensive side of the ball. Just to give you a quick glimpse, again, 35-year-old, he, not a, not an elderly gentleman by any stretch of the imagination, but listen to this road. For DeMarcus Covington as a coach, at UAB 2012 as a defensive graduate assistant, a defensive graduate assistant again at Ole Miss 2013 and 2014. Then he goes over to UT Martin because he gets an opportunity to be the D-line coach in 2015. Then he works his way up to Eastern Illinois. The fight in Jimmy Garoppolo's in 2016 to be co-defensive coordinator and defensive line coach there. Then he finally lands in the NFL in 2017 as a coaching assistant. Had that low-level, call what it is, low-level sort of title. That's a a quality control-ish kind of title if you're familiar with how things operate around the the rest of the league. Uh, those coaching assistant titles under Bill Belichick were essentially the low men on the totem pole. And you had a lot of responsibilities because those coaching staffs were small, but there was a lot of grunt work and late hours and not a lot of pay, and that's just how you lived when you had that title. 2017 to 2018, that's the title DeMarcus Covington had. Then he became outside linebackers coach in 2019, defensive line coach from 2020, to this past season, 2023, and now obviously the defensive coordinator. So you're going to hear him reference some coaches who have inspired him and who have uh, modeled for him what it means to be a good coach at all of those different spots almost. Uh, You're going to hear him mention three in particular that had a real impact on him. You're going to hear him mention his father, Carl Covington, and the impact he had on DeMarcus in terms of developing him as a person to turn into the kind of defensive coordinator that he wants to be. So it's a great, great conversation here. And again, somebody who is going to make a massive impact on the season for the New England Patriots has had a real role here in New England for some time for some really excellent defenses. But now he's going to be able to put his own spin on things this year, and the Patriots are going to need that spin to be highly effective if they're going to be keeping games close in 2024. Without further ado, Here's our conversation with new Patriots defensive coordinator, DeMarcus Covington. I'm very excited now to have with us on the next Pats podcast, DeMarcus Covington, Patriots defensive coordinator. Thanks for being with us here, DeMarcus. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I want to ask you first, because this hopefully will be 
a nice introduction for our listeners, for our viewers, as to who you are and what you're about in terms of how you're going to coach things up this year. We've heard Gerard Mayo talk a lot about North Stars yep. and what he is always sort of gearing himself toward in terms of his approach and how he wants the culture to set up, things of that nature. When we're talking specifically about the defense, your defense, what's your North Star? What do you want this Patriots defense to be about? Yep. So when I, oh, we always preach to the players about like playing fast, playing aggressive, uh, being, you know, being fundamentally sound, and then being able to create takeaways. So that's what we always talk about, physical and aggressive, all right, being fundamentally sound, playing with good fundamentals and technique, and being able to create takeaways. So that's, that's the formula for us. It's interesting just going back over the years, having seen a number of different defensive coordinators who have worked for Bill Belichick, yeah. right? But not everybody does it the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt Patricia was going to do it differently than Brian Flores, That's who right. did it differently. Than, and now it's your turn. That's right. How can you put your own flavor on something that has worked, and you guys have been to excellent defense for the last several years since, you know, ever since you've been on the staff for sure. How do you put your own flavor on what has already been a relatively successful formula? Yeah, I think uh, – you know, the foundation definitely is there, has been set, you know, and I think that, you know, our players understand the foundation of where we want to be at, where we've done. And then for me, it's really just about doing what's best for the players and using the player strengths and then going and letting them be their, you know, their best on the game day. So that's how I look at it. Like, how can we find a way each week um, to put our players in the best situation possible and let them play fast and aggressive and use their strengths to our advantages. How much input do you allow them to have when it comes to, you know, this week, first game week to prepare? When it comes to putting them in the best position for them to succeed, how much say do you give them in terms of whether it's the calls on your call sheet or certain situations, hey, coach, I'd rather do this as opposed to this? How much yeah. say will they have with you as their defense coordinator? Yeah. We're about like, even you know, as coaches, we're about like teaching them tools and then teaching them how to use the tools in different situations. We have some smart players and we have players who've played in our defense for a good amount of years and understand our defense. So like we give them the tools to use each week and we teach them how to use it. We don't just give it to them and like, all right, just go. Like, this is how you use it in this situation. And therefore, like, they're able to, you know, go in the toolbox and like, all right, this is when I use this tool. All right, now this is when I use this tool. So that's how, you know, we build those reps. So it's not just like an open canvas, but it is where like, all right, I'm gonna give you a menu. Here's the menu you pull from. And then you use it based off of what you see on tape or what you see on film or what you see on the, on, like basically on the, on the field, on the practice field or in the game so that's kind of how I look at it and uh, that gives them a sense of ownership and again I'm not out there playing so they might see it one way on the field and they want to use a certain tool which I'm good with that. It helps a lot I imagine you have smart players like yeah. Kyle Duggar and Jabril Peppers and Jawan Bentley and that's Jelani right. Tavai on down the line that's right. who you can give that sort of freedom to is that something that that you have over time sort of come to adapt to your own coaching style and I am curious. Again, we want to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah. Is there a coach that maybe we're not aware of, not Bill Belichick, not yeah. Gerard Mayo, that you've been around that has helped make you the defensive coordinator that you want to be? Yeah. So for me, like, if you take outside of this building, it's like Kevin Peoples. That's a guy who started a foundation of, uh, you know, my coaching career. Jason Jones is another, another guy. Uh, and then also Garrett McGee. So, like, all three of those guys have been, you know, key uh, – you know, I would say foundations in my coaching career. And I would say my dad has been a foundation in my principles and character. So that goes with coaching too. So like you take all those, you know, those three coaches and then you put my dad in there. All right, that's where you build, you know, the principles of uh, you as a man, the character of you as a man, and then you apply the coaching part of it. All right, to all of the above and then you get a good coach. And so those coaches are from where along your journey? Yeah, so uh, Gary McGee gave me my first job, you know, uh, as far as like a, a graduate assistant at UAB. I worked with Kevin Peoples there. That's who really taught me the fundamentals of, uh, you know, defense and, uh, and and really just, you know, linebacker and D-line play. Um, and then really Jason Jones, who I was with him at Ole Miss, you know, who's now he's at UNC, but he's at uh, – that was when I was at U.S. Uh, Ole Miss. He was the DB coach there. So Kevin Peoples now, you know, he's a, a defensive line coach at LSU. Gary McGee, he's over at Louisville, a receiver coach. Like all those guys have been very, very, um, I would say, 
you know, uh, meaningful and impactful for my career. You mentioned your dad, and yeah. you've obviously had a, a long journey that got you here to New England. You've been here for a number of years now before taking this position. How excited is your family for this moment that you're going to be able to finally be on the sidelines and yeah. running your own defense? They're excited. You know, they, they've watched me put in the work, you know, from going from college, you know, moving year to year, month to month or whatever. Um, you know, just the way it's, you know, started from the ground up and then just even coming here, um, going to my eighth eighth year, working from, working my way up, you know, through the ladder. Um, and they appreciate hard work. So they're definitely excited about it. And they're, I know they'll be cheering me on from afar. Anybody get any input on play calls on Sunday? <laughs> just me. <laughs> and the defensive staff, of course. Like, we have a great staff. But only one Covington. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. I, I want to ask you two quick football questions, if I could, before yep. we let you go. Uh, one is about your defense in particular. You know, I think people at home listening and watching, uh, they know Matthew Judon's no longer here. They know Christian Barmore's unavailable, yeah. and they're wondering about your pass rush. Yeah. So if there's going to be one word that we might be able to use come Sunday night yeah. to have described your pass rush, what might that word be? One word, I probably won't be able to say one word, word, but it'll be controlled chaos. We'll be, you know, in the court. That's a hyphenated. I think that we can count that. <laughs> Technically, we can we can say that's one. So yeah. we'll we'll make sure that we do a good job attacking, um, you know, the offensive line. All right, and then making sure we keep the quarterback in the pocket at the same time. So that's what I mean by control chaos. So we're not, you know, we're going to be aggressive with our pass rush. And uh, again, we have players like look, we have players who can, you know, rush the passer too. Um, and obviously going to miss Barmore and, you know, Judon and the success that we have with them. Just like anything else, people move on, things happen. Um, we'll know, you know, why might things might happen, but uh, we always have to have the mentality of next man up and the next guys. Uh, now is their opportunity to shine. You look at like Jennings last year, all right, who didn't, you know, probably play, you know, a certain percent of the time. And then you look at the end of the year, there we go, leading the team in tackles for losses. All right, who would have predicted that? You know, Judon was out, okay? There we go. So this year, who's going to be that Jennings from last year? All right, you know, I don't know. The only time will tell, you know, what, what will happen from there. Uh, but I do believe there will be somebody, you know, maybe not just somebody, multiple people, um, that will help us uh, get that job filled. Last thing really quickly yep. about the Bengals in particular. Joe Burrow obviously missed a good chunk of last season. Yep. It looked like their approach offensively was different, obviously, with a different quarterback in there. A little bit more under center, uh, maybe some more play action. Burrow's obviously, he's been a lot of, uh, spent a lot of his time as a pro in the shotgun. As a, as a defense coordinator who's preparing now for the 2024 Bengals, are you wondering what to expect in week one here? Do you think it might look the way it looked late last season? Are they going to just go back to what they've always done with Burrow? How do you approach it? when you're going up against a team that has shown um, a willingness to do multiple different things? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they got their core pieces there. They got Zach Taylor. They got Joe Burrow. They have Higgins and they have Jamar Chase. So those are the key players that's been there for some years. So that's what they're going to do. You know what I mean? That, that's what they're going to do. Those are the four key components to that offense. Um, and so that's, that's how I look at it. Um, so whether whatever year you look at those four players right there, and you take out mixing as a running back, all right, and you add in the other players that are in there with Moss, all right, you add those players in there, then that's really that's your components right there. No matter what year, provide a pretty good challenge. You get a good <laughs> challenge on your hands this oh, week yeah. at Debarks. Thanks for spending some time with us as you get ready for the Cincinnati Bengals. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great stuff there from Demarcus. Hopefully you know a little bit more about him now than you did ten minutes ago. Really, obviously, energetic, passionate. I would also add confident assistant for Gerard Mayo going into his first year in this new role. It's a guy who, as we spoke about, is going to be without arguably his best player in Christian Barmore. They just traded away one of his two or three best players on the defensive side in Matthew Judon for a third-round pick. He's now down in Atlanta. And yet still... When he's meeting with the group of reporters prior to speaking with us on Thursday, and he's asked about those two pass rushers in particular who will no longer be a part of his plan moving forward, his answer is a fascinating one to me because he goes into detail as to why he feels as though their operation as a unit, quote-unquote, and their ability to execute as a unit will be the reason they win. 
So, of course, what, what is any assistant, what is any Coach Peary going to say before the team has even played its first game? They should be confident in what they're doing. They should have a feeling that they're going to be able to outperform the expectations of those outside of a given facility. And so I understand it. And yet at the same time, for him to be so expressive in his confidence that this team will be able to win games, and in large part because of its defense, I like that. I think that's what they need right now. You need people that are going to be attacking this thing from an optimistic standpoint, from an energetic standpoint. It's a it's a new staff, and on the defensive side, it is a young staff. And it will be an aggressive approach, is my belief. And I think we could see it as early as Sunday, going up against the Cincinnati Bengals. Because while their offensive line is, I think, solid, I think they have found a way to be average-ish across the board, which is really what all teams should be shooting for. Offensive lines are these weak link systems. You just don't want to have glaring holes here or there across that starting five, whoever you are. And I think the Bengals have done a pretty good job of patching that up. But the Patriots do know a lot about their projected starter at right tackle, Trent Brown. They should have a pretty good idea of how to attack him, maybe how to stress him and what he's seeing before and after a given snap. And they should try to move Joe Burrow off his spot. They should try to rattle his cage a little bit. This guy who missed a lot of time last year, who did not play a lot in the preseason, who was pretty heavily managed, especially early in preseason, and then even as preseason wore on in terms of how much they were willing to put on his arm, it sounds like there's optimism there in terms of his health and his wrist in particular, that that thing will be okay. Make him land on it a couple times. That should be their goal. It should be their goal every single week to knock down the quarterback, but especially this week to get after Joe Burrow a little bit and maybe force him into some bad decisions, if you can do it. He's one of the best in football at avoiding those. But if you can force him into a couple of those and get into the back of his head in terms of wanting to to protect that all-important right arm and want to protect his health, period, that could mean, I'm not going to say that they're going to pull an upset on Sunday, but it could mean a cover <laughs> for the Patriots. It could mean they keep this thing close. It could mean they keep this thing competitive. And that's what you should want. If you're being realistic about what this season will be, that's what you should be looking for. Going up against a team that has Super Bowl aspirations, call what it is, in Cincinnati. Go to their place with established players. It looks like Jamar Chase is going to play. T. Higgins is going to play. Joe Burrow is going to play. Some of the best players at their positions in the sport with Super Bowl aspirations. Can you compete with those guys? And I think because of DeMarcus Covington's unit, they will be competitive. Now, before we go, with that Bengals game in mind, just on the horizon for us, let's give some big picture predictions heading into the 2024 regular season. Let's start on the defensive side of the ball, and let's start with the approach, and let's talk about controlled chaos. How about DeMarcus Covington dropping that on us? If he were to describe how they plan to get after quarterbacks, controlled chaos. I love that because I think if you've been following this team, you have an idea of what that might look like. Remember some of these amoeba fronts that we used to see? Or maybe you get one player down at nose tackle for a time that was Trey Flowers. This was really when it felt like it was starting to catch on. And Brian Flores was the play caller for the Patriots. It's 2018. And they're starting to get a little bit more creative and a little bit more aggressive. And then we saw what Flores did in Miami, and now what he's doing in Minnesota. He's one of the most aggressive play callers in football. Is DeMarcus Covington going to get there? I don't know. But is he going to err in that direction? I think so. And so whether it's those amoeba fronts where you have one player down, maybe it's Keon White, who I've been told is, is sort of looking like to people in the building like a more athletic version of Trey Flowers. Somebody you could line up on the nose, you could align him at three technique, five technique, all the way out, play him as a wide nine stand-up outside linebacker. 
We used to see Flowers do the same thing. Used them all over the line of scrimmage for those great Patriots defenses just a handful of years ago that were winning Super Bowls. And he was one of their best players, if not their best defensive lineman in those Super Bowl winning seasons 2016 and 2018. And you have a potentially faster, more athletic, a little bit more explosive version of that in Keon White. That could get interesting. Put him on the nose. Let him work on this week. Maybe it's Ted Karras at center. And then you have a variety of different people who we know and we've seen rush the quarterback as as blitzers, as outside linebackers, whether it's Josh Uche, Anthony Jennings might get more into that mix this year because he was, generally speaking, an early down guy the last couple of years and played really well in that role. But maybe he's given a little bit more in 2024 after re-signing this offseason. Jelani Tavai, Jawan Bentley, guys that we think of as off-the-ball linebackers, but we know and we've seen both of those players. Tavai more than Bentley, but we've seen them both align on the edge. We've certainly seen them both rush the passer as blitzers. Maybe they're all standing up and walking around. Maybe even have Kyle Duggar, Jabril Peppers, guys who like to play in the box, doing that same sort of thing, disguising their intentions, having a chaotic, if you will, look about the structure of their defense, but all the while understanding what their individual roles are. One of the strengths of this defense will be their ability to disguise their intentions because you have so many versatile pieces. You have so many playmakers coming from different spots who can, on one down, be an outside linebacker, on the next, be an inside linebacker, or on one down, be a three technique, on the next down, be an outside linebacker. When you can create confusion, if you can create some chaos in the minds of the opponent, that's really going to give you a leg up especially against offensive lines who, like the Cincinnati Bengals, have a new player in the mix. And can you stress that communication between Trent Brown and the rest of that unit? The rest of that unit's played a lot of football together. And it feels like they've sort of figured some things out in terms of getting to that point where they they are comfortable in what they can put on the field week after week. But do they have a weak link? And the guy that was here for a long time, who, when he's at his best... And Trent Brown looks like one of the best tackles in football. But when he's not, he can have games where he has trouble. And so is that an area the Patriots try to pick at by using that controlled chaos sort of approach with their pass rush? They're down the star pass rushers. You have to do it by blitzing. You have to do it with games up front. You have to do it with movement. You have to do it with disguise. You have to try to confuse your opponent. And I think that's what we're going to see, which is why, as we get into our predictions here, I'm going to predict that the Patriots have a top five, top five, top five blitz rate in 2024 with DeMarcus Covington. Talk about that North Star. Talk about that aggressive attitude, that aggressive mindset that he wants his defense to take to the field week after week. There's going to be flexibility in there. This has always been a game plan team on both sides of the football. But I think with Covington and with their losses up front in Judon and Barmore, your your stud in terms of your talent, your stud pass rushers. Well, how do you create a pass rush without those types of guys? And maybe we see more from Keon White. Maybe we see more from Anthony Jennings. Maybe we're talking about someone on this roster. Dietrich Wise, we haven't even mentioned him yet. We know he's going to factor in in a, lar- in a large way, literally and figuratively, to what they do when they're trying to bother pa- uh, quarterbacks. But how do you try to generate a pass rush when you're missing those studs in terms of the talent? You throw numbers at the problem. And that, to me, is why I think they could be a top five blitz rate team in 2024. That's my prediction. I also think they trust their secondary so much that it's not going to bother them to throw extra pieces at the pass rush. When you trust your corners to stick with their men, when you trust your safeties the way the Patriots trust Kyle Duggar and Jabril Peppers – that, to me, is is the formula that any team would like to have if they want to be aggressive, if they want to blitz, if they want to try to get exotic in bothering quarterbacks. Prediction number two, Keon White will lead this team in sacks. In terms of physical talent, there is nobody better. already talked about the comps with Trey Flowers. 
Uh, I know our friend, friend of the podcast, Rob Ninkovich, who's been around the team a little bit, one of the many players who has been former players here in New England, who has been around this year's team because Gerard Mayo has welcomed those guys back with open arms. I know he thinks the world of Keon White's physical talent and going from year one to year two, we should only see, in my opinion, more consistent flashes of that physical talent. We saw it all throughout camp. This guy is powerful. He is long. And I think when he gets between the white lines, he has that mindset that you're looking for from those types of bull rush pass rushers that could lead to big numbers from Keon White. Now, it's all relative, right? Big numbers in New England's defense in terms of sacks is closer to 10 than it is to 20. But I do think that's within the realm of possibility for Keon White, who should have more responsibility on his plate in his second year and with Judon gone. Prediction number three, I'm high on Christian Gonzalez. He did not have an amazing training camp. I still have heard nothing but optimism about Christian Gonzalez headed into year two. I know Gerard Mayo made some comments about Gonzalez, and it, this was early in camp, and it felt like, ooh, maybe he, he's trying to poke and prod his second-year quote-unquote shutdown corner, who we've only seen for three-plus games, into showing more on the practice field. And that might have been true at the time. But they think he's a really good player. And they're going to need him to be a really good player in order for them to keep these games close and keep this season relatively competitive from week to week. But I think his movement skills are so rare that if he can stay healthy, I believe as the best corner on what I think will be a top 10 defense in terms of points allowed per game. I had them in the top five before we found out about Christian Barmore and before the Patriots traded Matthew Judon. So my expectations have come back, but they haven't come so far back that I think they're all of a sudden going to be an average defense. This is going to be a good defense. Christian Gonzalez is going to be their best corner, and my prediction is in his second year, Christian Gonzalez will make a Pro Bowl. I know. I can hear you smirking right now as you listen to this podcast. Pro Bowl. Who cares? Everybody makes the Pro Bowl. Well, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, I get it. But I'm not willing to go to the all-pro level yet with Christian Gonzalez. We'll see on that one when year three rolls around for him. But I think that is that is a realistic, maybe lofty, relatively lofty, a lot of good corners in this league, but a realistic expectation for Christian Gonzalez based on where he was drafted, what we saw from him in flashes against excellent competition, and basing it off what I know of how people in the building who are around him every day feel about him as a player and his upside, Christian Gonzalez, pro bowler, that's prediction number three here on Next Pats for the 2024 season. Let's flip it over to the offensive side for our last two predictions for 2024. Let's start at quarterback. Where else would we start when we're talking about the offense? Drake May, when does he see his first action? What is our prediction? When the schedule was released, so this was before training camp, well before training camp, before even what we saw from Drake May in the spring, I felt as though the best place for him to start if he wasn't going to be the opening day starter was late in the season, and I actually liked the Colts game right before the bye. Okay, so play a beatable team, which is what Indy is in my opinion, get the entire week of the bye to digest that which you saw as a first-time starter and then handle the final month of the season and roll into 2025. That felt like a nice, sensible, logical way to go about getting Drake May's feet wet. But based on what we've seen in training camp, based on what we've seen from this offense, based on what we've seen from Jacoby Brissett, my prediction now is that we see Drake May in October as the Patriots' starting quarterback. Now, when in October, I'm not sure. But before Halloween, my prediction is you will see Drake May start. Now, part of that will be performance. I think this offense is going to have a hard time getting going. And I think they're going to be looking for a spark. And I think a month into the season, the Patriots brass, 
is going to feel better about how ready, quote unquote, Drake May is. Is he going to be fully baked by October? No. But is he going to have a better idea of what NFL defenses are throwing at the Patriots from week to week? Is he going to have a better idea of how to prepare? Is he going to have a better idea of what his team is trying to do offensively on a regular basis? What works for them and what doesn't? Is he going to have a better feel for the speed of the game based on seeing it, if not up close as a starter, up close and for real from the sidelines, on tape? You want to throw in the virtual reality stuff that they're doing and that they believe in, they're they're spending time on that? Throw that in there as well. I think October seems right. And it might be because of performance. It might be because of availability for Jacoby Brissett. He's a big guy. He's a tough guy. And you'd never predict injury for anyone. But based on how the offensive line has performed, I'm not sure they're going to be able to protect him consistently enough that he is available consistently even relatively early in the season. I'm not sure of that. I don't feel like anybody can be sure of that based on what we've seen to this point. So Drake May, October. That's prediction number four. Prediction number five, a quick look at the receivers because that's what you care about. After the offensive line, after the quarterback, the sexy position is the receiver position. What is that going to look like? Who's going to play? My prediction is you're going to see a four-man rotation there. Javon Baker, not going to be a part of it. It's been a tough summer for him. He started camp hot since, I would say, the first week, week and a half of training camp. He has been anything but hot. Off the field, getting himself into trouble with the team, posting on Instagram Live, on the field, having trouble aligning, having trouble simply catching the football. That, to me, has been his biggest issue. He came into the league, we talked about it earlier on this very podcast, just after he was drafted. The one concern, the, the, the top concern with him as a player was his drop rate, about a 10% drop rate at UCF last year, among the worst in last year's draft class in that regard. And we have seen that continue into his first training camp and even into practices. We're only out there for 15 minutes or so. Uh during this week one of regular season practice. And even when you watch him in drills, he has a hard time securing the football. And so for all of those reasons, I don't see a role for him early this season. And it might take a while before he's able to establish himself as somebody they trust. Four-man rotation would be Pop Douglas, Tyquan Thornton, K.J. Osborne, and Jalen Polk. I think with that group of four, they feel like they have... A diverse skill set. You have your shifty slot. You have your speed guy. You have your savvy veteran. You have your young but versatile in a vacuum in his own right as an individual player in Jalen Polk. And I think that's the group. And yes, you might have to adjust here and there because of injury. Certainly, Tyquan Thornton has not proven that he can stay on the field for any length of time. Significant length of time, we should say. But if that group stays healthy, that to me is their group of four. And you roll with that, and you hope they grow, and they develop, especially Douglas and especially Polk, who look like they could be staples in this receiver room for years to come. And they might still be looking for, they are still looking for, clearly based on their pursuit of Calvin Ridley and Brandon Ayuk, that true number one. But I think you've got the potential to have an excellent two and three moving forward in Polk and Douglas. What you would like to see is to see those guys continue to develop as Polk has from the start of the spring to now, as Douglas has from being a six-round pick out of Liberty to now. You just want to see that continued upward trajectory in terms of their improvement. So four-man rotation for the Patriots. Receiver group, that's what I would anticipate uh, at least early in the season here. One bonus prediction. Let's do the let's do the the big one that everybody does. Let's do let's predict the record, right? When the schedule came out, I predicted this would be a six win team. Six and eleven. After watching training camp, while I feel as good as I thought I would about Drake May and his prospects as a player, you know how I feel by now. If you've listened to this podcast, I thought he was the best quarterback prospect in this year's draft. 
I thought he was further along and more polished than many were willing to give him credit. I thought he was further along and more polished than many were willing to give him credit for. I did not anticipate seeing the struggles that we've seen from the offensive line. And to me, that's a significant enough factor for me to dock them a game in my prediction and go from six wins to five. So that's where I'm at with them right now. Of course, we all would be thrilled if they proved everyone wrong, Vegas included, who still has them as a a four-and-a-half win team, and exceeded all of those numbers. But that's where I'm at with this team for right now. And again, you're hoping for competitiveness. You're hoping to see whether it's Polk or Keon White or Christian Gonzalez or Demario Douglas, all these first- and second-year players that you think could be cornerstone pieces for you moving forward. You want to see that group continue to grow and evolve. Drake May, it goes without saying. And show you something. Give you some level of hope moving into next season. And maybe it's Drake May by the end of the year. Maybe they do roll with that plan that I mentioned earlier. Right before the bye against the Colts and then the last month of the season. And maybe he wins two out of his last three. Then you really do have something to sink your teeth into in terms of hope, in terms of promise. And you have something to look forward to next year, and they have the resources to really improve this team significantly when the season ends going into Drake May's second year. That's what you have to hope for. So there are your predictions. There's your conversation with DeMarcus Covington. You've got a football game that's coming up. I can't wait to sink my teeth. Speaking of sinking our teeth into something, sinking our teeth into a football game week one of the regular season. We're going to talk to Matt Castle next week about the quarterback play. Whoever it is, Jacoby Brissett, for as long as he's in there, anybody else I might get in there, who knows. But we're going to have Castle on next week to tell us about the Patriots offense and what he saw in week one will be a great conversation, as it always is, with our guy Matthew Castle. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the games this weekend, and we'll talk to you next week.